Ready. Three, two, one. Yippee ki yay, mother. Welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to another edition of Yippee Kaye Mother Podcast Remake Edition. What's going on, everybody? Hey. Hey. How's it going? Hey, hey. Sean, you can talk now. Oh, good, because I didn't want to make another mistake. <laughs> you know, I just wish Denzel Washington was a more dominant character. He should have spoken up earlier about the way his family treated him. Okay, we'll get into that. Before we get there, I want to mention uh, the passing of Treat Williams. Oh, my God. And there's Burger. another big passing, too. Burger, oh. here. Yeah, um, he uh, got killed in a motorcycle accident. Yeah. Uh, Treat uh, Williams died in a motorcycle yeah. accident. 71 years old, right? Isn't that what Seven, yeah. he was? 71. 71. I, love I think we all know him City. best from Deep Rising, but he was also in other fine films. 1941. Yep. Uh, um, what, was it, um, what was that comedy, Dead, where he's a cop and he comes back from the dead? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, dead Heat. Dead Heat. Dead, dead heat. heat. Dead Heat. I felt so bad for him on Joe that. Joe Piscopo. Like, Wasn't that Joe Piscopo? Yeah, Joe Piscopo. Yeah. That's right. That killed his film career, too. Well, that's Treat Williams. Rest in peace. Who was the other one, Sean? You said somebody else? Oh, somebody you should have been following. Yes. Cormac McCarthy died. Oh, right. That's right. You know, probably. Best known as the screenwriter of The Counselor. That's right. So his, his, I would, That wasn't his last one, was it? I hope not. Would say that was his only America's, movie he ever wrote. I'm not so. going to say it anymore. America's greatest living author. But he's no longer America's greatest living author. 79 years old. An eccentric character. An outstanding writer. I would definitely... I think the best of the books he wrote was um, Blood Meridian or The Redness of the Sky in the West. Everyone should check it out. They've been yep. trying to figure out a way how to make that into a, a movie. The movie rights were bought 30 years ago, and no one's able, been able to figure out how to make it. I could do it. If anyone out there listening, because you watch this podcast, you're a studio head. Once the strike is over, the WGA contact me we'll make that movie okay yeah, he um, was 89 years old that's uh remarkable 89 remarkable or life. 79 89 89 okay all right and so i tell you what i just want to say no country for old men is probably the best adaptation of anything he did i think that was a truly outstanding film you know and then he did the counselor may he well, rest in peace yeah may he uh, rest in power so we'll do we'll do the remakes. We'll talk about Megan's and Seven. Then we'll spin the wheel for next week's remake, and then we will talk about what you watch quickly, um, as quickly as we can. All right. So John, I think this was your film. This was my film. I did bring it uh, because I'm a huge <laughs> fan of the 1960 original film directed by John Sturges, based on Seven Samurai. Wasn't uh, that essentially a remake, though? What Seven Samurai? No, the Magnificent Seven. Yeah, it's a remake of Seven yes. Samurai, and this is a yeah. remake of a remake. I love that movie. It's one of my top five westerns of all time. Anytime it's on, I watch it. The cast is unbelievable, and it was, all came to fruition because of Yul Brenner. Uh, he saw he saw the possibilities after seeing Seven Samurai, and got the rights to it and got it made. Uh, just, it's a fantastic film. The score by Elmer Bernstein is that iconic. Is classic dun, score dun, 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 uh, just a great score i just love this movie and i i've saw the remake um the antoine uh fuqua is that how you pronounce it yep. um uh i saw it a while ago and i i just rewatched it and you know normally when we do these the the remake almost never especially when it's such an iconic movie the remake almost never does justice to the original i think the magnificent seven the remake for what it was I really did enjoy it. It was a fun, like a summer uh, film. I, I I enjoyed the performance. I like Denzel Washington just about anything. I thought Chris Pratt, who was supposed to be Steve McQueen, was kind of useless. Um, uh, I thought the bad guy, you know, when you do a side-by-side -side comparison with the cast, I still think the original had a much oh, better cast. The bad guy like, in like this Steve one was... McQueen, Steve McQueen is like the coolest dude ever, and yeah. Chris Pratt just wasn't like that. But the bad guy, uh, uh, Peter Sarsgaard, he was Seething. like a cold guy. Seething. He was terrible. Yeah. Eli Wallach as Calvera. Now that's a bad guy. Yeah. And was uh, the motivations were different. 
look, my complaint about, and I, I, I liked it. I liked the movie. I enjoyed it, but I do have some complaints about it. I thought Chris Pratt was not good in it. I didn't like his character at all. I thought that, you know, when I first watched it, I didn't think about it, but they definitely checked off some boxes for the time that this movie was made. You know, we got to have the most diverse, magnificent seven of all time. So we're going to have each, every category is going to be covered in this movie. It was much more bombastic than the original. There was a lot more dialogue in this one than the original. And I think what made the original so good was the simplicity of the story and the dialogue. I mean, some of the characters have about five sentences in the whole movie. James Coburn hardly says anything in the movie, but you remember his character vividly with what he did. Um, so, so, you know, comparing the two side by side, that's where my criticism comes in because it was such a, the remake was a movie of its time with the big explosions, <clears throat> even the, the way they shot the guns, it sounded like a cannon went off every time a gun was shot. Yeah. But having said that, I did enjoy it. Does it does it even come close to the uh, original? Uh, no, uh, this that is not a movie I would watch over and over again when it comes on. The original of uh, the 1960 version, I would every time it comes on, I watch it. I will also say that there was a TV series starring Michael Bean as Yul Brynner's part. Actually, I thought was a better adaptation of the uh, original movie than this one was. The ca oh. char character wise. When did so that I, series I come out? What was that? When did that series come out? Uh, I think it was. I think it was the early two thousands. I'm not hundred percent sure. I think it was only one season. Um, uh, what? Nineteen ninety eight. Nineteen ninety eight. It was a great mm -hmm. cast, and Michael Bean was great. He's not Yul Brenner. I mean, let's be honest. No one's Yul Brenner uh, in the league. But um, I, I, I did like it. I mean, I, it kept me going till the end. But even like some of the stuff they did, you know, they brought up some, some of the same lines. Um, you know, I've been offered a lot for my services, but never everything. That was a line taken from the original movie. That's a great line. I it is a great line. Needed. But but what what kind of bothered me, Yul Brynner's character, Chris, you know nothing about, right? He's just this lone gunman, very mysterious. Where you going? Where you been? You know? But at the end with, with Denzel Washington, they had to give him this reason for wanting to go after the bad guy. And like then they, do, one, two, three, they do the whole hang him high thing where he pulls down his shirt and he's got the, I didn't like that part of it. I liked the idea of not knowing anything about uh, like you'll burn his character. I didn't think it was necessary. Cause I really like I like Denzel Washington's character in the film, but again, it's so hard because uh, the original is so, is so iconic for me. But but I, I will say I I enjoyed uh, the remake. So that's okay. My take. So let's get this straight. The original is iconic, can't be topped, and this one's okay. Right, right. I think we've said that. We most of these we've said why even remake the movie? There's no reason to remake a classic. This I, one, I'm I, thinking I, I about think the I, studio pitch on this one. The yeah. studio pitch is Denzel Washington is a cowboy right. all in black. Right. Boom. Let's make that film. Right. And then they wrap it and they do the Magnificent oh, wait, Seven. Wait, one other thing I forgot to mention. The whole movie, I'm waiting for the Elmer Bernstein theme. And it comes uh, Horner, it James did. Horner did the music. And the music was actually pretty good. But I'm waiting for the theme. Now, they did variations of it, but they never played the theme till the closing credits. Credits, right. Yeah. And I'm like, what a cheat that was. I wanted to see that during the movie. And that's one of those things where I think people... That would have been a real callback to the original, and people really well, would have could it have been contractual? It might have been. It might have no, been. because they used. Well, it. they could play it at the end, so I don't okay. know why they Maybe. couldn't have done it. Okay. Here's and the I thing think that, that really Horner's lifted my spirits at the died. end. Yeah, James James Horner. Um, died he read it. the script and he wrote a suite of music, and because he liked it so much, and then he died. So some yeah. of the people that worked with him took that suite of music that the director was very excited about as well, and they turned it into a score. And some people say it's like the most. James Hornery score of any James Horner score because it has a lot of different uh, pieces of James Horner scores in it. But that's kind of how he wrote. A lot of his yeah. music echoed itself. And I don't think that's a problem if you're watching a movie and you go, oh, I recognize that drumming from Aliens. I mean, so what? It works in Aliens. Right. It works in this. It's not the same. So this is, I think, you know, a nice score for him to go out on. And I, I, um, I he died like what he was 61 or something. So he he would have had a lot more movies ahead of him. So adapting a classic that was done as a as a i think a pretty good job of uh, of a remake then uh, that was a nice thing for him 
I mean, yeah, the uh, the uh, Peter Skarsgård was just a sniveling, you know, snidely whiplash. I mean, right from the get-go. There was no subtlety at all. I mean, Eli Wallach, you kind of like him. He's kind of a, you know, personable dude. He's evil as shit, but, you know, at least he had some character. And uh, Was it Eli Wallach? Was I right about yeah. that? Yeah. He was, char he was kind of charming, charming actually, charming. as and evil as he Skarsgård was. Skarsgård starts right in that church scene, right. makes a kid stick his hand in the dirt and all that stuff. Right. And it's like, wow, this guy is just seething. And you know he's going to get it at the end. You know he's going to die but yeah they kind of buried the backstory um i think it's it's once a time in the west with the harmonica we kind of get yeah. glimpses of what that was about throughout the film and this one because he was hung like um harmonica's brother at once right, upon a time in right. the west mm -hmm. um but then they you know the, the the i guess we can spoil this 2016 everybody knows what happened so um and then to have him not actually kill the guy right which is where they flipped it because that woman's wa uh, husband got killed at the right. beginning uh, needlessly. It was ridiculous. I mean, it was silly. That's the thing about, for me, I liked, I could rewatch this one all the time more than the original because I, really? just, I, I could watch the I remake find, more. Yeah. I find it more wow. interesting. I don't, you know, I know that other one. I get it. I get why it's a classic. I actually like it a lot. I don't like this new one as much as that one, but I, this one is for me is more watchable. I like Chris Pratt's take on and I, I read something or watched something where that was supposed to be written as a more hard character and because it was chris pratt they bring the chris prattisms to it and all that stuff he was doing with the cards and him being you know cute and the the, the joke about the guy falling out the building and all that uh vincent d'onofrio i thought was f fun eli in um uh, ethan hawk you know cliched but he was great uh, billy I, I i liked the characters i enjoyed it you know and they put all these you know the mexican guy and the uh, native american everybody's in there everybody's in there and there's a there's a good native american and a bad native american who ends up and they're going to have to go head to head they're going to have to go head to head um yeah it's it's an enjoyable romp i thought and um you know i guess they were you know to, to try to remake seven samurai that's that's a tough one to do and then remake mm -hmm. this remake of a remake it's a pretty bold thing to do and anton fuqua you know he did a pretty good job his shots some of the the horse riding and all the the fighting scene was was beautifully shot. I mean, just stunning. So the, the, well, the God sweep, lit it. The sweep, the sweeps that he did on the the cameras and all that with the horses. I just thought it was. Oh yeah, really it was beautiful yeah, it was shot. Even the, I mean, the, the townspeople are always cliched in these, right? It's always yeah. the same kind of thing. But and I also thought thought that the town, especially in that early in the church scene, I was watching it and I was like, wow, the townspeople here. Are, they're all remarkably handsome. Everybody in that town looked really good. Matt too. Balmer yeah. sitting like in the back there. Them, yeah. That's why he had wow. to die. That's right. <laughs> Too pretty for the West. But no, um, yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the original of the 1960, um, and I love Eli Wallach. I would have to say, um, you know, I, I I was surprised I hadn't seen the remake of uh, the Magnificent huh. Seven. I just I never caught up with it. It wasn't, you know, I love the original one. I was like, yeah, maybe I'll catch up with it. But I actually enjoyed it a lot more than I expected to. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with the power, with the quality of the actors. You know, Denzel Washington's great. I actually liked Chris Pratt's kind of more jokey, alcoholic kind of guy, uh, especially since like a long. <laughs> Basically, they changed almost every character, right? You know, they took the the Robert Vaughn character, who was you know a guy who'd a gunfighter who'd lost his nerve, and they kind of put that on the the Ethan, Ethan Hawke character. Good night, Robichaux. Yeah, Great name. exactly. Great name. I and, love that name. Yeah, that was worth fantastic. The and so, but I'm a big fan of Ethan Hawke, and and so like I liked a lot of his stuff in there. Yeah, I would have to say that, that Peter Skarsgård as um as the um, Bartholomew Bogue. The, the as the bad guy was probably the biggest step down um and the other thing nice about it too is like i mean antoine fuqua he really stages action well i mean yeah. you know since like i think his first movie was was when chow yun fat tried to break into the replacement yep. killers replacement killers yep and that movie while not good is got great action scenes in it you know it's got some solid action in it um, is that the one with the big car wash Fight or something I, I, I honestly don't i just remember it had mira sorvino yeah and counterfeitter and of course you know china and fat doing its thing. um and you got denzel and ethan back together after a training day. training, training day, day. Yeah. yeah that's i didn't even think about that yeah. yeah notice how training day drove ethan to drink mm. yeah, was, yeah yeah he was yeah. but it's a, it's um you know it's a, it's a solid little remake i don't think it's in the same category as the original um the one of the scenes from the original that I always love is there's a scene and it's the first time 
Calvara and his gang um, get into a shootout with the with the seven. That scene where the the camera is tracking and it's Eli Wallach riding that horse and they're jumping over the um, little fences. Uh, and it's just obviously it's on a truck or you know a rail whatever that's one of the most amazing shots i've ever seen in any movie i absolutely love that and unless i'm completely wrong or it's his twin brother it i think it's eli wallach really riding that horse too so, well, back then they knew how to ride horses yeah yeah i mean i think they did because there was a couple of scenes in here where chris pratt is riding a horse and i was like is he even on a fake horse like it he didn't he, like you just kind of like moving. Yeah, it did look a little sea biscuity sometimes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, but no, I mean, I, 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 um, I was pleasantly surprised at the at the remake. Quite honestly. Cool, Debbie. <clears throat> well, I didn't think this movie, the remake, had the uh, character development and the group sensibility, and the jokes were really flat, and um, the acting was the costuming was awful oh i couldn't i couldn't believe that that was what they wore back in those days you know it was it just didn't match it i thought it was like um stupid you know hmm. stupid costuming for that time except for denzel now he i was interested in him black horse black dressed in black that was kind of cool but then again there was no funny I didn't think it was that funny they're joking around and nothing beat the Magnificent Seven I mean they were to say it succinctly they were magnificent you know Steve McQueen your brother well I mean you know, all of okay, them that's Charles, Charles Bronson. Bronson. I mean, come on yeah and, 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 and you know going into this they're feeling that way i mean there's no way they could not know that they're what they were up against so sure. so just embrace what they were doing well here, that... here's my thoughts of the film i saw the film in the theaters when it came out obviously and um you know first i love the original film and i called you the original film the original film is a remake right mm -hmm. you know it, yeah. is, it is it is the remake the original one you know, because it's Seven Samurai. And I'm just going to go a step back. You, it's hard to compare those two films because of their different strengths and the cultural things. Seven Samurai is, is a classic of world cinema. You know, it is really a great film. And Magnificent Seven is a classic, you know, world cinema, but particularly of the genre. And But it's it's Americanized. You know, it's so much more succinct. You know, the characters are developed quick, more quickly, but they're all the same characters that were in The Magnificent Seven. And I think one of the faults of the, um, of the new version is it doesn't have that character who desperately wants to be one of them, hmm. who learns a little hmm. something, you know, that they really don't necessarily want that life, that loves the village, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They don't have that character unless you count the girl. That's what I was just gonna say. The woman, yeah. but there were that seven might guys. Qualify I mean, for she that. didn't want to do that, but she ended yeah. up. You know, but so when I saw this in the theaters, I'm like, it's no Magnificent Seven, but it's it's an entertaining movie. You know, I mean, I didn't sit there and you know grumble throughout, and I'm gonna credit a lot to um, Denzel Washington. I thought his just his look was great. Yeah. And Denzel brings gravitas to anything 100%. he does. Sure, right. you know, I mean, he he's a he's a towering actor, and this is a great role for him. You know, I love him in an action role. You know, I love him with a gun. You know, and um, he's great. And I really liked um, Ethan Hawke a lot. You know, too. I really liked the character, and I hate to say his companion, the um, the Asian actor whose name eludes me. The knife thrower. The knife thrower I liked. James too. Colburn. Yeah, the James Colburn. Except James Colburn only had one knife. This guy had 62 of them. <laughs> you know, and James Colburn would go to the gun, and this guy did too. But um, I really liked Chris Pratt when I first saw the film. I didn't like him as much the second time. And his entire plan on destroying... And here's another thing. I, I think maybe I know a little more about weaponry of the Civil War period. And I think that Gatlin gun was way too far away to be that effective, to be cutting through that stuff. Even if it could, even if it could literally shoot that far, by the time, you know, 
they would not be passing through buildings like that. The, the shells. It was the devil's too, breath. The devil's breath. Well, you know, there's a deleted scene of them testing the Gatling gun. They shoot off Jack Black's arm, and it is pretty intense <laughs> to see the power of the gun. So I, I trust. I, I guess I get your concern about the rage. Yeah, but at that but point, it is, I mean, it's you're still not, a fearsome weapon. It's, it's the reality. Yeah, but I mean, it's certain it's certain things. <laughs> the certain things bothered me and also the absurd plot of chris Platt, pratt it's like he's going to go out there and they're shooting they're shooting the other horse people giving him cover that are following him then he gets out there and he lights a cigarette which i could see one of the bad guys lighting it up but it's like this was his whole plan was to go out there light up a cigarette and light dynamite and then throw it under there and my question is, he's racing out there. Why didn't they just turn the Gatling gun on him? It was within the, the arc of it. Because he's just he's just one guy, so they weren't afraid. Like, just one starfighter is going to get through and put some... You know, that was like, you in know, a, blowing up those like, wombats in the... Um, Exactly. Whatever. And I mean, that, that. that's. I think. I think Drew's right about that. They like. He's a mosquito coming at them. They don't care. They figured they're going to get him. I anyway. think they were shocked that one guy was trying to yeah. take out the. And gun. They, I think they weirdly respected that. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole no, thing. No, I, I can see. Obviously, the guy came the off the thing. Right. 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 So I mean, there were like ten I, of them. But that, if you're gonna, if anyway, that's the so. one that, that that I mean, to me, that's one of my favorite scenes. I know it's cliche and it's stupid and it would never happen but i still love that he it's very now, so let me just say the whole misdirect the misdirect i thought was funny and uh, now i will say you know to me the big problem with magnificent seven 1960 is when and, and i mean they go to an effort to make it understandable but Cavera letting them go and then giving them back their guns mm -hmm. thinking that they're, you know well they're professionals you know they really don't care about these people you know i'm going to let them go and if I kill them, their friends are going to come down and on us. So, I mean, to me, that's very difficult for me to buy in the original movie. Really? So, I, you know, but I buy it. I sit there and buy it. So I guess I'm buying Chris Pratt Pratt, too. You know, but, you know, it's just, I know my favorite line is Chris Pratt when D'Onofrio comes by and he kills those two guys and he's walking off and he goes, I think that bear was wearing a man suit. You know, I thought that was no. My favorite in that one, they, they were the famous Pearson brothers or something. Yeah, Pigeon brothers. Pigeon yeah. and Pigeon Ethan Hawke says they're not, not very long or something like that. Yeah, they weren't like, famous. They very weren't long. famous very long. <laughs> so yeah, you know, uh, this you is know. this is a tough thing to do to 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 generate interest in a remake of classics like these. This is really, and I think this was one of the better ones. I think so too. Oh gosh, yeah, I think so too. Drew, what are you at? Where are you at with this one? Well, my, my favorite part of the remake was when they accidentally killed the invisible uh, swordsman. I was really shocked. That, <laughs> you know, I, I haven't watched this. Made me want to watch Three Amigos again because that's a, another basically the same riff on the same thing. Uh, I love Seven Samurai. I, I find that, you know, that movie incredible for all the reasons that everyone who's ever seen it finds it incredible. And so The Magnificent Seven is not as good as that while still being a great movie and the biggest thing that the magnificent seven does for me is what we've been talking about i i mean the cast is incredible steve mcqueen is just the, you know doesn't get cooler than that but i've always i just love yul brenner i just think he's such an incredible presence on screen and i did like that you really didn't know anything about him except he is some kind of murderer decent man and that's what the town needed and they found the right guy like the whole section of seven samurai where they find the people and they they learn like how are we going to pick out these people and then they find someone who helps them pick out these people that was a much longer movie and that part was very compelling so both of the, the magnificent sevens it almost feels a little rushed through that but it didn't it wasn't bad because you also want to get to the you know taking on the the the, the bandits and, and and everything um I liked Peter Sarsgaard's uh, performance as a villain because he is ridiculous. Like Eli, Eli Wallach is, is charming and you can tell his men have some, they have some combination of, you know, fearing him and also respecting him, respecting what they fear. So he's the leader of the gang and, you know, and they, they will go and in, in, into danger for him. Bogue is only money. That's all he has. All of those people are, they call them Blackstones, but they're basically Pinkertons. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. basically mercenaries uh -huh. that you hire. So he has, um, you know, I, I don't even know how many people he threw at the town at the end. 200. 100. All of them. I mean, it's yeah. ridiculous. But be, be, those people aren't fighting for him. 
They aren't fighting for a cause. They aren't fighting for each other. And that's what the magnificent starving. Like no, 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 I'm talking about the the um the 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 Blackstone guys and and the people that they're fighting and that I mean they 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 kill a lot of townsmen and they do kind of destroy the whole town as they're saving it. But you know they're they're the complete opposite. And so you have um without turning it into some sort of like noble pure thing um that these people are pure whatever they're just regular people who don't deserve what's happening to them and these guys are are there and i don't i don't even remember if compensation came up the way it came up as twenty dollars for six weeks of work um in the in the original but you know you don't you don't care about that you know that's not why they're fighting at the end of it Mm -hmm. and i told uh kelly i i said i haven't seen the remake since uh it came out when i remembered enjoying it you should watch it with me. And she's like, I am not interested in that, but I will watch it with you. And she really enjoyed it. Although <clears throat> when you first meet Vincent D'Onofrio and he's like, these two guys hit me with a rock. And she said, is he going to talk like that the whole movie? And they said, <laughs> I don't think he talks very much in the movie. Awesome. But hopefully not. So good. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, voice. it was, it was, it was great. It was really, it was just fun. And to see a Western that's just fun is always nice. It was, it was very violent without being that bloody. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's not surprising that the same guy made the equalizer movies but those movies are like really yeah. nasty violent. Yeah. and i enjoy them too but i thought it i thought it was uh it was fun and it made me realize i've never seen um what is it the return of the magnificent seven and the what is the magnificent seven right yeah, yeah, yeah i haven't seen either of those i don't know you guys have, if you've seen them you yeah. can tell me if they're worth time but it was no. it was fun going back they're to their not, world yeah. they're not worth it okay no they're not so, so yeah so i mean the magnificent seven is one of those movies i mean i think our our other our fans have already told us that there are remakes in india and there's probably remakes in multiple countries and then of course there's tons of movies that are inspired by it whether it's three amigos or bugs life and comedies and dramas and action movies and all that kind of stuff it's just a very compelling six. story <laughs> yeah ridiculous i mean it's just a compelling story and and you know this remake uh i enjoyed it it was just fun yeah. and i don't have any sort of holy reverence for the original magnificent seven but i think it's a fine film and a fine western and i don't mind that they both pale next to the the, the towering seven samurai it doesn't bother me because they're just riffing on similar themes right. that i can relate to right. so this was a good choice this was fun to go back and watch both of them well yeah. kurosawa loved the magnificent seven he, he yeah he should it's to, very entertaining because he was making his western that's what he said when he was making mm-hmm. seven samurai sure. Yeah, one yeah. Thing, it's funny with the new one is as much as i like the characters i i did feel like the original had a couple of really just great scenes of them together that you never quite got with the new one yeah. but one that, that comes into my mind the best is when horst buckholtz's character the young guy is trying to be one of them and you know and the one guy he, he's talking about how like you know they're talking about the numbers right he's like pharaoh dealers you can name you know because they know you by name 200 all these mm-hmm. things and all these negative things and then you'll brenner's like t- places you're tied down to zero men you step aside for zero and you know and and robert vaughn is like you know insult swallowed zero you know and he's enemies and they kind of look at him and he's like left alive you know it's so yeah. great it's like and the kids like that's the kind of math like, i like yeah you know yeah exactly that's the kind of math i like you know it's and it's funny because i felt like in the original there was a lot of that camaraderie that really really worked uh, i don't think this one ever quite got there uh but like i said i you know i was really i enjoyed it I, the, and it's funny too when you just look at the way that action is done and staged from the 60s i mean the Magnificent Seven is action-packed, and so is the Seven Samurai, for that matter. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they have a lot of actual action, action. Um, but how they're staged is different, you know? It's like uh, when Calvera finally gets shot, it, it, it's just kind of, it's almost a little underwhelming the way he goes out because, you know, I'm yes. so used to the bad guy having this huge kind of over-the-top, you know, epic death, while Calvary just gets shot, and he just, you know, he just kind of falls down, and he's like, a man like you, why would you come back, you know? And that's it. Well, don't they all in the, I, I, I can barely remember, but don't they all in the, the Magnificent Seven, six, 1960, they all kind of die quickly. There's no, there's no big over-the-top. No, you're right. No, there isn't. Right. And, and, and this even, one, like, you remember Ethan Hawke and Billy getting shot up there, and yeah. And, and Vincent obviously D'Onofrio. Vincent D'Onofrio getting taken out the way he got taken out. They everybody had a you know what's considered a good death in this film. 
That wasn't like that in the other one. It was more matter no, of fact. No, because there were more dramatic is... deaths in this film. That's what I mean. I mean, I, it's more over the top. And there really yeah. is only two relationships in the film. It's it's Billy and Ethan Hawke. And uh, Ethan Hawke and Denzel. He knew about his sister or something. Right. There was some backstory that Ethan Hawke knew. So that's that was really I the I want to know what battle we're fighting. The one in front of us? Or the one by right, that's a, that's a, yeah that's a clever way to but say that. But you think that. about like the like the opening scenes, right? The, the, and contrast the two. Denzel goes into the bar, and you think of all the tension, right? As he's he's uh, you know mentioning the person he's looking for, and Chris Pratt's at the table, and they're all looking at him. They're all going for their guns, and then it's this big gunfight where he starts blowing everybody away, right? And in the original version, it's the hearse scene, where the only time he shoots is to shoot the hands of the two guys. But there's as much tension in that scene as there is in the Denzel scene. And it's like, like completely, completely different type of scene with the violence in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, and then that's what I mentioned earlier about the score. That's when you hear that famous score as they ride right. the hearse back the other way. And it's just such a powerful scene. And it tells you everything you need to know about those two, Yul Brenner and Steve McQueen's characters. So it's just, you know. Yeah, I mean Denzel I was something. the yeah. Denzel was the focal point in this film. I mean that's that's obvious. And, and oh he, yeah, and he seemed on you know he seemed standoffish, like he seemed like somebody he that he wouldn't get close to anybody. Where in the other one, those guys did sort of build a camaraderie. They try to do it in this film, the dinner scenes as they're sitting right. around the table. It just didn't. They couldn't. No, there were scenes that felt you can't forced, fake that they were that. trying to. Yeah build that well, camaraderie but it just didn't work. that's what there, gabby lost she it, liked it, it didn't it have beginning. any it didn't have any heart you know like feeling sorry for the townspeople you gotta you know really milk that you know that sympathy for them and their heroes these seven magnificent seven people are coming to save these sad townspeople farmers and that farmers. that is like really noble you know <clears throat> when you're taking on that challenge because that, uh, you know, is worth fighting for, you know, these people that are pretty much desperate. Well, so I, I think, think that were... this movie did not have the heart that the uh, the first one had or the second one. Well, let's face it. it the first one was better written. Well, because it's able I mean, to accomplish on, on. A, a lot more with less. This yeah, was, I agree with that. This, this had the whole revenge thing, setting up with the right. husband getting killed at the beginning and then Denzel having his backstory, which only popped up at the very end when he pulled right. his shirt down and you realize, okay, and you know, he mentioned his family getting wiped out. So it becomes a revenge thing unless just mercenaries going in to help these people. Right? Now, here I'm going to go through on this, you know, and this is something it bothered, the other thing that bothered me about this movie this time, and it bothers me on James Bond films too. It's like, henchman he's got like 200 guys and they're being massacred they're being blown up with dynamite and if you're just there for the money you're gonna sit back you're not gonna say oh what's Bo gonna think of me he's gonna lose respect for me you know these guys are just hired hands and you know when you're that when you're just a hired hand and you're not fighting for anything but money you know I don't see them going in and doing what they did i just don't see it you know in i don't know i mean they wouldn't get paid if they didn't take the town yeah but they didn't so, want to you don't want to die it's sort of like there's a right. great uh, deleted scene in austin powers yeah. where the henchmen go home yeah. to their yeah. to their wives to talk about <laughs> what happened and who they're working for yeah, and <laughs> the guy who got run over by the steamroller no, they that guy. Yeah. that's so funny yeah, yeah I mean, but i just think about I mean, that i mean it's always these unnamed people who have lives outside of what they're doing right there and it's you hey, know you know the red shirt it's not because they don't the care about star. it right. they weren't part of the empire they're just cleaning the death star they all yeah. got blown up right. so it's hard to i don't know i don't know uh, i just have a hard time motivating that because at least with the cavera thing he's one of them you know He's sleeping with them. He's riding with them. They're his men. He's their leader. He's rough. He shoots them when, you know, you know, and he's, he's not going to let anyone run away. But they're all starving. You know, it's like yeah. he's not food. fighting for what, you know, for well, that's wealth the weakness or of this. The weakness of this film is the revenge angle of it. That is right. the, 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 well, and the motivation for wiping out people like they did. I mean, right. This I was like hang them high. This is more like hang them high. Yeah. 
than well for than magnificent yeah, well seven. it did in the end it ended up like that well the yeah. same thing where they take the town and they turn the town you know help the town kill a bunch of people and all that i mean but with the with the with the revenge with the neck thing i mean definitely well, so the one thing i definitely was thinking when you know that whole army's coming towards the town and it's a beautiful shot and there's like what 200 horsemen or whatever and all i could think of was that scene where they stop them in um, blazing saddles from yeah. arriving too yeah. soon, <laughs> yeah. putting up the toll booth. Well, that's yeah. like, they're going to build the this here. Oh, that's it's the governor. Perfect. Somebody go back and get a shitload of nickels. Yeah, yeah. You know? uh, yeah that's you all can, I get a shitload of dimes. It's hard shitload not to compare when you see that stuff. You know, it's funny. Uh, Eli Wallach, uh, uh, if you watch the making of the original, um, the the guys they used for his bandits were like real rough and tumble uh, Mexicans, and he hung out with them in their little camp camp or whatever. And they really felt like he was the leader of that group. That's why his, his uh, interaction with them was so, was so strong. Is if that you right? Also, he never could put his gun in the holster without looking at it. He, he never, oh, no. all the other gunfighters flipping it and putting it in. And every time you see funny. him put his gun, he's always looking down. He goes, I just couldn't figure that one out. And Stern just thought it was the funniest thing. <laughs> all right. Well, what, so, I mean, okay. Same old, I think remake. everyone enjoyed it for the I, most part. I definitely listen. For me, it's, it's a rewatch. No, this is I, not I, a rewatch for me, though. Yeah, I got to be. But honest. I like. Debbie, it. can I ask Debbie a question? What's oh, that? Yeah, sure. Ask Debbie, me. did you like this one better or English Vinglish? Oh, English Vinglish was better. Okay, good. Hmm. Now you're punking us. Yeah, that's no. weird. No. Uh, all right, let's. Uh, well, I also want to say I think that Peter Sarsgaard going over the top as this, you know, really basically insane villain. I think oh, this God, worked God. much better here than it did in the Green Lantern. Oh movie. my I knew God! Don't. That. Oh please! I he doesn't even that. put that on his resume anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was seething in this, and you know, it's just there was, was not an so, ounce. It was of... so. It was so one-dimensional yeah. evil. That's the thing. Yeah. yeah. Like, but he did have one great line when he shot that guy. The sheriff who came and told him the news. And then he turns to his man and goes, would Vanderbilt or Rockefeller had to shoot that guy himself? You know, yeah. it's sort of like none of you guys are stepping capitalism up. Capitalism is God. God is yeah. capitalism. Yeah. 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 Well, right. well, before before we finish, I think we haven't really talked about her. Haley Bennett plays Matt Bomer's widow, the one who actually shoots Bogue at the end. I think she's a really kind of wonderful actress. Well, and I was wondering when I first saw this, are they going to make her part of the Magnificent Seven because she was the one of the few categories of people that wasn't represented in the Seven was was women. But she, I, I don't know if you guys know much about her, but she's sort of worth checking out other things that she's done. She did a Hardcore Henry and Girl on the Train. She's also in a movie called Swallow about a woman who has the compulsion to eat things oh, that yeah. aren't food. Yeah. And that's that's a, like it's an incredible movie. But she there's she has such depth. Of, of skill as an actress and you're not going to see that in a movie like this or music and lyrics or something but you should check out swallow because i think she's very compelling. Wait a she like, swallows I, stuff that's not yeah like like yeah. like you know like in batteries or object. coins stuff yeah. like that wait a minute is this and an think, a24 film i it sounds like it right it might be i don't know it sounds but just I, like an a24 plot I, I used to think of her as like she's the jennifer lawrence a clone yeah. like skeet ulrich and johnny depp or something she's <laughs> she's really quite a fine actress she's so. in one of the equalizers too yeah, she's, uh, uh, I think, in the first one. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's see what's next week's remake. I think all my pit choices are gone. I think you guys did all mine. I can't wait for Island on the Well, John, around. what's your prediction? You've been right every time. Um, oh, yeah. I think Evil Dead. Oh, I hope so. I hope you're right. It's coming around. I can't believe it. Oh, frick. Oh, almost. <laughs> oh, it's almost there. All right. So this is Drew's, right? Yep. Yeah, oh, Drew. That this was is... gonna be my. That was gonna be my first choice. Actually, I, went, I changed it to Evil Dead. Damn. Damn. Okay. <laughs> you can't retroactively. All streaks and John. Don't feel bad. Yeah. Um, yeah what's so this a remake this, of? This is a remake of a movie called District B13, which is a French action movie. You can find it on um, uh, Hulu, and uh, I think it. It might not be on B13. Disney Plus. District B13. Uh, it's a French action movie that was basically uh, the introduction of parkour to mm -hmm. um, to action films. And the, the people that are 
are in this some of these are the guys that are basically known and it's one of these things are they really those guys i don't know but they're from some of the first people that actually invented parkour and you know made it known internationally and one of them actually goes on he's in the uh fourth Die Hard movie uh as a as one of the villains as a henchman um and it's a it's a really really exciting dynamic action movie that also has a lot of really kind of interesting things to say about um, French culture and politics and people. And then Brick Mansions ten years later was a remake with Paul Walker that is also a movie. So I look forward to uh, watching <laughs> District B thirteen again because it's fantastic, and I think that um, the remake will have some interesting lessons about. Now, the kind can of I ask? Stuff did we about. wait a minute? Are they like a family in Brick Mansions the remake? Like in the Fast and Furious films, it's really about family. No, Paul Walker has played other roles. Okay. Did so. you guys pick your remakes based on liking the first one and not the second, or how? What were the what, were the, how, what was the reason for picking the ones you guys? Were? I know. I, only, I have, both I have both different. Versions. I have different opinions of of one over the other for my choices, but I think they're both worth watching. Okay. That's what we'll talk about. Okay. So we're gonna have to watch both of these if we haven't seen either one of them, right? I mean, yes. Or just go on YouTube and find a compare and contrast. Okay, Ralph, send me the link. That's, that's one well, way to do it. Listen, if you're gonna if you're gonna watch one and pretend that you watch the other, watch the original on okay. this one. Really? All right. It's it's an all timer. Yeah. Okay. okay. And it has and it has a sequel as well that is uh, is also pretty good. So okay, District B thirteen. All right. On Hulu. And then Brick Mansions. So okay. I'll just say I'll watch the first one, then I'll say the second one. You know what? It just didn't work for me. It's a movie. There you go. It's a movie. Okay. It's a movie. It right. is a movie on celluloid. Okay. Camera was placed. Uh, all Excellent. right. Let's do a round of what you watch. A quick round. Let's start with Sean and Debbie. Well, you know, we were watching the Truman Show. Actually, it's not the Truman Show. It's that show, Jury Duty. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's fantastic. Yeah, Ralph. Best show on that. television. Yeah, Ralph's been raving Funny. about it. Did you yeah, watch the um, whole thing? Yeah. Well, not no. Yet. We, we got we've got to watch the last episode, but. For those who haven't seen it, it's this guy, he gets on jury duty, not realizing that literally everybody else, you know, the lawyers, the defendants, the, the, trial. the, judge. Witness, the judge, and all the other jurors are all actors. Improv. And he's he's really in it. Yeah. And, um, it, you know, it's hilarious. And what's really hilarious is James Marston, the actor, is in it playing himself. And, you so know, funny. somehow I think it's really him. You know, he's really playing it. They sure it comes off like that. And the kid Ronald yeah. that they hired, that, that they ended up Ronald is his name. The guy who was on jury duty. He whoever found him deserves uh, big credits because he was he is fantastic. Yeah. So and his interplay like, with James Marsden is one of the highlights of the the show. Yeah. So, and he's really level headed, you know, on a lot of things. If you listen to Ronald. Him. Yeah, Ronald. Ronald. Yeah, yeah, no, I've been raving about this show to anybody that will listen. Um, I just think it's one of the best reality style shows we talked about this before there's been a couple others mm -hmm. like leader of the bands and stuff like that where they you know create a, a rock band but this one is and again it's a concept this particular one i don't know if they have other ones in the can because i don't know how you pull it off more than once because once once you see it it's done you're not going to believe anybody anymore well there have been three seasons of too hot to handle and that's based on you not knowing what sex game show reality show you're you're being recruited for so i guess they can pull maybe it off they, they can maybe they can and ronald now is actually on real jury duty <laughs> oh my god he actually got called to a trial so that's pretty that's interesting. funny well, and also following okay. we actually listen to what you we watch this because of your recommend uh ralph and we're so glad we listened to what you said you have some really good um uh, eyes for good stuff well I don't following. watch a lot of you know I don't yeah. watch a lot of reality stuff and if I find one I like I, I but you're watching a lot more since you got married no well Maria yeah. watches the yeah, Vanderpool Vander rules or pumps or whatever the that. hell Vanderpool yeah, Vander and Pumps I happen to watch yeah. that but no this one the reunion show this one I, there I, should I, be I, some kind of drama with that going on right no the, no this drama. is called something or other scandal no drama Sean you had another quick one yeah another quick one I've also you recommend watching shiny happy people about the tuggers oh my god i've only through episode one but here's one one great moment when jill's talking about how she knew how successful they were because she went into discovery and they had this poster this like big thing of them all on the oh on the unis unibike oh, yeah. you know unis not unicycles they um try bike with them all on the different seats right that was a huge piece of art 
And when we closed that office building down, you could take whatever you wanted if some people did. And that they put outside my office because I had edited the last season of the show. And they kept saying, Sean, you should take this with you. And I really would have, but it was a huge thing. And I was driving a big Buick then, and there was no way I could figure out how to bend that or move that or some way to get it into my house. But after seeing the show and hearing her talking about it, I wish I would have taken it. I would have contacted her and said, hey, do you want that? I have it. You're only on, on the number, the first show of that? Yeah, I'm only on the first one. I don't know if you'd want to keep it after you watch the rest, but maybe. Yeah, I, I'm watching. I, have a feeling I just finished that. watching that as well, and it's it's really Dark. it's really worth watching. It's it's kind of an extraordinary thing, and it you know you, there's certain things that you you see there's big sort of uh, uh, projects and initiatives and things that are happening that are shaping our society, and what you see as a reality show that's a hit show that's just a gateway to these forces that are happening in evangelical uh, Christianity in America that you watch and you go, okay, I didn't know a lot of that, so that's fascinating, but also that explains an awful lot of uh, people that have been appearing in politics in the, you know, the last five to 10 years, Madison Cawthorn and all these other people. And it's really, I, I thought it would be good. I, it was, it was very distressing, but it was yeah, really worth watching. Because they're armed too. It's the other thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, it's, it's like Scientology for Jesus and yeah. it's really, um, it's fascinating. All right. So Drew, now that we're on you, what would you watch? Well, I had a real, um, a, a real whiplash type of tone week because i watched that but then also i watched the show I, I don't understand why i didn't know that it existed but there's a podcast uh with uh three people that i really like jason bateman will arnett and uh sean hayes it's called smart less and they basically the premise of it is the three of them are, are gonna talk because they're friends but one of them has brought a guest and the other two don't know who it is and so they'll surprise them with here's your good friend david letterman you know like just a lot of like, different people it's very exciting and they'll try to bring out people that they know the other two guys aren't familiar with that sort of thing and uh they actually have a show uh called smart less on the road which is six episodes on max not oh, hbo um i have not laughed that much at a show in a long time because every episode is following them on their tour and some of it is footage from their live shows, which are great. And a lot of it is the footage of them just kind of hanging out and busting each other's balls and being in the hotel room and being on the tour bus and being on the private jet. And it's so incredibly funny. And uh, I, each episode is about 40 minutes. For some reason, they shot the whole thing in black and white. It doesn't matter. It looks gorgeous. And uh, if you like any of those people, like Jason Bateman, Will Arnett, Sean Hayes, uh, you will like them even more yeah. because they are just impossibly funny. So I would recommend Smartless on the road. Uh, I would, I'd watch it again next week. It's just that funny. Cool. John. Uh, I watched two things. I watched, uh, I'm a big baseball fan and I'm a big card collector. And one of, uh, one guy I always collected, uh, autograph cards and all his rookie card is Nolan Ryan. And there's a great documentary on Nolan Ryan. And yeah. I don't think people, appreciate how great a pitcher he was and what a humble guy he is and when you watch this it's about his family it's about his struggles when he started with the mets um it's it was really fascinating and you 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 forget how good he was the seven no hitters he's got records that will never ever be broken ever in baseball and i i recommend it highly if you're a baseball fan, if you're just a human being fan, you should watch it. The other What's thing it I called? watched. Well, hold on. What's it called? I, I it's called. Um, I think it's just called Ryan. I Ryan. think that's okay. what it's called. Yeah, I watched it on the plane last night. Um, because you have Direct TV, and it, it, mm -hmm. you know, and that was one of the choices, and it was great. I loved it. The other thing cool. I watched on Netflix, I watched the first episode of Fubar, starring uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, I'm wondering about that. And I, I got to tell you, I've only seen the first episode, but I really liked it. Uh, he plays an, a, a CIA guy who's retiring and they need him on one last mission to rescue one of their agents. And they find out the agent is his daughter. Um, and, and, you know, she's a very strong, you know, she's a great agent. But it, it's funny watching him because you know, he's an old guy now. I mean, he's he's not young and um, his action stuff was pretty good. But I, it was funny. <coughs> you know, they play the age bit and he's got a crew around him. So it's kind of it had a kind of a true lies feel to it mm -hmm. also. But it's really good if you get a chance. Now, I don't know how the other episodes are going to be, but I really did like the first episode. So check it out if you get a chance on Netflix. Have you cool. seen, John, the, anything with David Duchovny's movie called uh, 
effing Bucky, uh, F Buck, uh, Bucky Dent, effing Bucky no. Dent, Bucky fucking Dent. Yeah. No, it's supposed to be very good. Yeah. But very funny. The company directed it? it. I think he wrote it and directed it. I don't know if oh. it's in the theater. It's doing the. It's doing the. No, it's doing the film festival circuit right now. It's just yeah. at Tribeca, F and so Bucky it'll, Dent it'll get a release. Oh. I don't know if I could watch that movie, to be honest with you. Well, <laughs> I think you should. It's uh, a very pa- yeah, I know. Uh, is the is the is the movie that you watch called Facing Nolan? Is that Facing right? Nolan? That's what it is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah so I, I thought it was one really about his family, Ryan's daughter, <laughs> or Ryan's <laughs> Express. Uh, On Ryan's Chris, Express. That, that's what his name. Um, was. Yeah. I, I actually watched very little of uh, this one. But I did kind of, but I revisited after um, speaking of Arnold, I revisited Conan and the Barbarian. Uh, John oh, Williams, because we kind of talked about it a little bit a couple right. weeks ago. And man, that's a great film. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, um, James Earl Jones, yeah. all, you know, I name Doom, something Doom, right? Uh, yeah. Tulsa. Yeah, Tulsa, Tulsa Doom. Doom. Yeah. And then um, I forgot, like, Max von Sydow's in that movie. Like, it's yeah. only in one scene, really, but he's in that film. It's really, yeah, it's it's pretty great, you know? And it's it's one of those things where uh, the action is bloody and brutal, and it's really, it's just. Well, and he was jacked in that movie, too. Oh, he, yep. Yeah. That was like him in his prime. Yeah. That sword, and, uh, I don't know how much that sword weighed, that broadsword he, he did, but that thing, oh, he was well, great. On the music. Yeah. The music is just Plaza spectacular. Well. Yeah, that's that's cool. that's cool. Sybil Danning yeah. in that one. Who's, who's yeah. the no, woman? No, not Sybil Danning. Who's no, the, it's woman? Like, the woman is uh, Sandra Bar- Bergman. Sandra, Sandra Bergman. Bergman. Yeah, oh, Sandra, oh, Bergman. Sandra Bernhardt. All that jazz. No. Oh, 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 oh. And there's not uh, Sandra, not Sandra Bernhardt. Funny thing about that, for one little note in there, there's a scene in the film where um, Conan's killing a giant snake, right? And his, like, his buddy, the archer, is shooting it with arrows. And um, I found this out that apparently um the arrows are, are shot pretty close to him so instead of trying to come up with this really you know crazy way of doing it um they just shot arrows like right next to arnold right Jesus. and um nobody wanted none of the stuntmen would do it so milius did it i was gonna say shot- that oh, so yeah, i certainly want the director to shoot the arrows. Yeah, wait, the, it's John milius. director shot the arrows he shot the arrows yeah oh my God. yeah i mean when you it's funny when you go back and you look at it you're like really really not that close they're like four three feet away Doesn't but when matter. you stop and think about it three feet still pretty close yeah. it's Jeez. like with um it could screen- have been worse they could have let the screenwriter do it well he probably <laughs> yeah. was the screenwriter. but uh yeah. speaking of but it's like speaking of kurosawa um he did the same thing to uh to shiro mofuni on throne of blood like there's a scene where he's running back and forth and all these arrows are plunking into the wood next to him they're apparently just real arrows there was no oh, like Jesus. there was no uh special effect there oh, wow <laughs> so the terror well, did the same thing there's there's some new book years. out I, I i'm gonna i pre-ordered on kindle that some woman talks about the the abuse that goes on on sets in movies and tv <laughs> shows that you're gonna look back and like the lost lost had a lot of stuff going on in oh that yeah that people. book is supposed to be great yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be really good I hey, can't the original the robin hood uh, not the original the one with uh errol flynn hmm. you, you got paid more money if you let an arrow plunk you they would put balsa wood in your <laughs> under your costume and they would shoot an arrow at you oh and you got God. extra money Christ. for taking wow. the arrow but you know what um that's John, on one of your favorite movies when they shoot that woman in the head the assassin yeah, what they really the shot something onto her head, and they had one of the people do it. They like, she had to like keep her eyes open and not. Oh right, I read about that. Having a... that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah, and that um, was really da- you know yeah. that was a big prestige picture. So you usually don't shoot people with stuff in their head from a projectile. <laughs> yeah, no, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Ralph, what are you watching? Yeah, I'll be quick. Uh, I, thank Drew has been talking about Canopy forever, and finally because <laughs> of. A movie we had to watch i finally signed up for it and holy crap it's freaking awesome yeah uh, so i i, I re a couple too. of documentaries yeah, that i just love one is enron the smartest guys in the room yep. great uh, one which is just a great watch and the other one was the bridge uh the, the about mm-hmm. the uh, golden gate bridge where they oh i a, want to see that one where they put a camera up there for a year and just told stories about people who they actually taped jumping off it's pretty oh my god it's well, they interview people who who survived too. Some survived, crazy. but some yeah, they went crazy. back to parents, or they went back to the person's apartment to find the letter that they left. But you know, they got in a little trouble for what they did because they didn't really tell the the the, the San Francisco what they were doing with this. But they really pointed a camera and would watch 
and and somebody would jump and they wouldn't try to stop them they would just shoot oh. it. why would you um, while they were not they were like a remote camera. because it's yeah, quite I mean, they powerful there. because it's very yeah, powerful it's, i mean john because, it's even it's even more fun than you think yeah it's even lighter than you're imagining it's not light at all but it's it's uh, excellent though it's it's a one it's that a, doesn't it's a, definitely doesn't sound like a movie it's a strangely beautiful like. documentary because you know it's i'm, I'm fascinated by the golden age bridge for some reason i got a credit card with a picture on it I, everybody thinks i live in san francisco when i pull it out i'm like no i just like the bridge i don't get it anyway so that canopy subscription you get that library uh, so you know, what does the, the subscription cost nothing nothing you, you, you get just a, use your library card. You get an, and, 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 and I got an electronic library card. I just signed up. Yeah, you don't yeah have to Drew sent that link. Yeah, it's amazing. Drew, you guys just get an electronic card. Yeah, yeah thank you, thing. Drew. Yeah, I You're welcome. You a library card? You can do it online. You just Because uh, so many libraries have digital resources now. You so know, you can I just have an electronic a, card, and then you can have access to video I, services and, and, and checking check out ebooks and all that stuff. Yeah. I just have an observation for all of us. Don't you think talking about library cards just nails the the hammer that we're all a bunch of nerds <laughs> um well no because it took you guys forever to get to the library to canopy <laughs> i'm the, the nerd that i have a as long you know, as i've known drew yeah, he's been talking about nerd. canopy let's go get a yeah. lot and i finally i can't get over it it's like this unsung it's just it's, amazing they have a ton so of stuff beautiful. on canopy yeah it's got that makes a, me a nerd that's there you true go, well, that's, uh, you're more, that you're more of a geek <laughs> You're more of a geek, I think. And I, I also told you guys that, that, that that's not the only video service. There's also a couple of other ones, but the, the one uh, Hoopla uh, is another free service that you can watch. And that was the only place when I, a friend of ours came over and we wanted to watch a certain movie. That was the only place I could find that was streaming shows. Oh, I'm reading books on Hoopla. <laughs> I didn't know that Hoopla yeah. has movies too. And, and Drew. Oh, yeah. And Deep I wanna... Star Six. That's a classic. Drew, I have a question. You know that's overcranked. Yeah, that film's overcranked or something. Like they did something weird to that film, so it, so it play quicker. Hey, yeah, Drew. Plus they wrote it. Yeah. Yes, Debbie. I have a question for you. How's uh -oh. the uh, Jeopardy uh, situation? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing to say. Um, uh, you just gotta wait for me, a call. call. Is that me. what it is? If they want me, they'll call me. Yeah. Oh yeah, my gosh. Well, anything? Who wouldn't? Can we, can we? How can we grease the palms a little bit? Nothing, since this is apparently going to be in the episode, nothing. I would do nothing untoward or yes. request anything special. Yes. And yes. Everybody it's shut nay. the fuck You don't have to do anything. <laughs> yeah. Sure, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> All right, so next week we're going to do, is it Brick Houses? Is that the name of it? I'm sorry. Brick, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's Brick yep. Mansions, Brick House. District, Brick Brick District B13. Brick Mansions, and, uh, District and Brick B13. Mansions. Uh, remember or District Lou. B13. Drew, you're going to have to text us the title of that French movie. It's Next it's just district the word district and then the letter B and the number thirteen district B thirteen and it's on Hulu. Uh, just on Hulu. John, watch the show. Writing them down. I mean, obviously, oh, I have it's not it on, on the wheel, right Ralph. No, the yeah, Brick Mansion is on the wheel. wheel. This is right, why you B13. want to subscribe, hit the notification button, and smash that like button because you don't get stuff like this, this on every show. No. Okay, Ralph talks classic. about all these other shows that he streams, but this is the one you want to be watching. This is the one. So, all right, everybody, have a good week. See you next week for Brick mansions and brick houses brick house. i'll see you on he's a brick house, house. 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 house.